Good morning, this is Jim Moore and you are watching Words of Encouragement. It is September 13th, Wednesday, here in normally sunny Texas. And it's cooled off a good bit today. It's episode number 676. We're going to be studying today about your worth. And uh, really believe it's going to be a blessing to you today. Having some connectivity problems today. So, you know, anything worth having is worth fighting for. So I just encourage you to hang on there. Having some sound issues again this morning, too. So come on and let me know if you can hear the sound. So we're going to be talking about your worth. We're going to be talking about uh, the mighty, who the mighty are. And no, not one and a Holy Spirit trifecta. So there's, let's see, we got Linda. We've got uh, Stella. We've got Linda again, you know, my beloved. Nice to have you. It looks like Shane came back. Hope you all come back. Yeah, this is something that happens quite frequently. It seems like, you know, this morning I had a kind of a feeling in my heart it was going to be a powerful message this morning, something that the Lord really wanted to share with his people and, and strengthen his people with. And um, it's always like we just have to understand the enemy always wants to interfere when there's something. If we judge by the lack of difficulty, then we typically... Yeah, we bail and we jump ship and we don't get it. So Christ Ambassadors, nice to have you back. And Linda Etherton, yeah. So I assume that you're all being able to hear me now. Cheryl, God bless you. Debbie, God bless you. Nice to have you. So make sure and jump on and say hello. And we'll do our best to say hello back. Monty, nice to have you this morning. So one of the things I felt like the Lord said to tell people right away this morning when you were watching is to really listen, you know, hard, carefully, whatever, to to what's going to be shared this morning, because I think it's going to help you. We live in a time when we need strength, okay? <clears throat> I don't ever meet anyone that goes, oh, yeah, I've got all the strength I need. Usually, they're the arrogant ones that fall away, <laughs> but we are living in difficult days, and we do need to encourage one another, and so much more, the Bible says, as we see the day approaching, and so the that's what this is about. It's about strengthening. Now, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord. I believe I have the word of the Lord this morning for you. And I want you to really personalize this and really understand that the Lord has something to say to you. Uh, one of the best ways, it's interesting, I'm looking at the clock right now and it's 9-11. <clears throat> so actually, this is uh, September 12th, I think. And uh, day before yesterday was was 9-11. Okay, so now I'm looking at the clock and it's 9-11. I believe that's the Holy Spirit saying we are in a 9-11 kind of emergency in the world and we do need the supply of the strength of the Lord during these days, okay? Sometimes we just go along day by day and just do our stuff. We don't think much about life. We're just getting jobs done, checking off the box, you know, doing whatever. And we, we forget that we really need Him to put divine strength to manifest his strength inside of us now one of the ways that he does that there are many ways but the word of god is one of those ways the joy of the lord is our strength right how many feel like you could use a dose of joy and i found that joy is a choice okay he's already in you his joy because he's in you his joy he is a joyful god he lives in you the joyful god lives in you you have access to his joy but we forget sometimes that you have to, sometimes you have to contend for those things. It's interesting, the nine fruits of the Spirit, they're not your fruit, by the way, they're His. You're accessing His fruit. This is not, oh, I need to produce the nine fruits of the Spirit. That's, I mean, yeah, of course we want to do that, but that's not what it's saying. It is the fruit of, not of Jim Moore, not of Debbie, not of Linda, not of Monty. It's the fruit of who? It's the person, the third part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. It's his fruit in you. So we have access to his fruit. All right. So the other, one of the ways that he gives us strength for the day in which we live is by helping us to see ourselves how he sees us. Now, this is not going to be just some kind of a spiritual back rub. You're so awesome. You're so great. I, I, I mean, I'm not even saying that's altogether bad. I mean, we get together and give each other spiritual back rubs, I like to call it, and, you know, talk about how great and how awesome you are. And you're Okay, I get that. I get that. 
But, you know, what we really want is not, because that can lean over into flattery pretty quickly. You know, flattery is just telling somebody something that they want to hear or that you think they want to hear in order to get the kind of result that you want to get, okay? We don't want to do that. We want the truth, okay? How does God see me? When I, if I were to be able to look through his lens and see myself, how would I see myself through his lens? And uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, books that I've been quoting recently, because I've been reading it again, is the, it's the Final Quest trilogy, okay? It is the Final Quest is book number one, the Call is book number two, and then the Torch and the Sword is book number three. I have no books in this, my life, in 40 years. I'm 60-some, but it, I started reading <laughs> in 40 years. 40 plus years, there are no books that have changed my life as much as these I believe that's because the Holy Spirit gave me, he opened some of these things up to me. And of course, beside the Bible, the Bible's in a book, in a category all itself. We, I don't even compare the Bible to other books. We're talking about the Bible, standalone, and then, yeah. So I think it was Debbie had asked me uh, to put a link on there. I don't really have a link. I mean, I think you can find perhaps a PDF version of one of these. I recommend that you don't do that. I don't think that's what Debbie was asking for, not like a free version. Uh, I've actually done that in the past. I found a free version and downloaded it, but it really is kind of a pirate thing, and it's not really, I don't think, uh, you know, that's a publisher thing. Really, you ought to spend the money, and you can go on some of these used books uh, things, like, well, even Amazon and such, and they've got used books, and you can get these books, any of those three or all three of them. I have one book that's all three put together. You can get these online for a few dollars. I mean, literally half the price of a coffee cup. So I encourage you to do that. But again, when you read it, don't read it like some kind of a fairy tale. Okay, I don't know about you, but when I have a, a vision or a dream or, yay Jesus, a open-eyed experience seeing the Lord, okay, I'm not talking about my experience, but when I have one of those, I take that serious. You know, Solomon it says, was the guy that saw God. God said, I showed myself to him. I presented myself. I revealed, my, he saw me. Now, how did he see him? I don't know. Maybe he saw Jesus. Maybe he saw a, 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 a dumbed down version of God. Nobody can see God in his glory and survive to tell about the story. You just can't. But he does say that I appeared. That's the technical term. I appeared to Solomon twice in a dream. So don't discount that. So when I get something like that, I take it seriously. And here's something else. When you get one like that, and I know you, and I know your character, and I know you're not someone who tells lies or is deceitful, and you have a dream about the Lord Jesus, I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to pay attention to that. So when you read, and this is not just about these books. I'm talking about things in general. You know, when the Holy Spirit talks to you, when you open his Bible, when you read a, a legitimate experience that someone had that you trust, or you had an experience, you've got to pay attention to those. That's why I always tell people, write down your dreams. Okay, if you at all think they're of the Lord, write them down. All right. So I've said all that to say, we're living in, in dark days, but there are also glorious days, and we want to make sure we focus. And so if you will listen, I believe today the Holy Spirit will speak to you. So I don't always do this, but I'm going to pray. Father, I pray for the hearts of your people who are listening today, for those who take the time to say, I'm hungry for revelation. Lord, open our eyes to see ourselves, to see our worth the way you see it. Not the way we view ourselves or someone else views us, but the way you see us. Give us a literal Holy Spirit intervention, Lord, that will help us to be strong in these days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. So, obviously, the truth is, is if you gauge your worth through what you perceive about yourself, through your eyes, through your experiences, okay, I think the eyes is one of the big things. Oh, so you're tall, you're short, you're thin, you're, you're heavier, you're big, you're little, whatever, you're, you got a lot of money, you don't. People like you on Facebook, they don't like you. You have a lot of friends, you don't have a lot of whatever, any of those things, the, the literal, how can I say it, um, the literal definition, hi Karen, nice to have you, the literal definition 
of unconditional love means that it is not based on any human condition. Okay. Uh, the picture that I put on Facebook this morning, I hope that you had a chance to look at it. If not, you can go there and go to our, our site on Facebook. And uh, I basically put a picture of a man holding a baby. Now, if my friend Isaiah is watching, I hope he is. He just had a little baby boy. He called him, what did he call him, Emmanuel, I think. I forget. I know. Sorry, my mind. Anyway, Isaiah loves that little boy. And I heard somebody say this, you know, some other person, it was some movie person said this. Isaiah loves that little boy in such a way that he would probably take your life if you tried to hurt him. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying <laughs> nothing bad about it. Yet. But I heard a man say that once, some actor or something. He said, I really never understood this whole parent-child relationship thing. I didn't understand. You know, sometimes we have broken fathers and broken mothers and broken people break people and so on and so on. But, he, but this uh, actor said, he said, within five minutes of that child, he's talking about his child being born and me holding that child in my arms, I would have killed anybody on the planet who tried to hurt him. Why? I know that's cute and everything. Ooh, babies. Yes. No, but listen, 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 for real, for real. Why? That child hasn't done anything. He hasn't had a chance to do anything but to cry when he came out of the womb. How is that? I want, do you know that that's how God sees you? You see, you measure how you are, your worth, let's call it that, your value. You see that by how you've lived. Okay? By the mistakes you've made or by the good things you've done. Popularity. If everybody likes me, then I like me. Okay? Uh, you know, your appearance, your physical appearance. Okay, if I don't look like everybody else, if I'm not beautiful, blah, 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 then I'm not. Then it, in your mind, it devalues you. And we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that means you. And it really is true that if you were the only human being that ever existed on planet Earth, Jesus would have died on the cross for you because of love. Not because he needs you to serve him, but because he loves you and he has tremendous value. He literally exchanged it for yours. That's the level of his value. I'm going to go in the Word of God just to go on the scripture. Dana. Da oh, that's Dana. God bless you. Different pronunciation. Nice to have you on. And there is James. Nice to have you, James. All right. I beg you to go back and listen to the this. You need to understand the foundation of this. This is not hyperbole. This is not fantasy. This is not make-believe. Okay, this is real. This is how God looks at you. When he look and, and listen, listen to me. I'm going to dispel a myth right now, kind of a myth, maybe a misinterpretation. G God does not value you only because he looks at you through the lens of his son. All right, before you shout heresy, let me tell you. A lot of people, well, God sees you through the lens of his son. Yes, he does. He does. He absolutely does. But that is specifically in the area of righteousness, not love, okay? There is none righteous, no, not one. Christ came. We now have his righteousness. When he sees you through the lens of his son, he's looking at your, we are the righteous of God in Christ. That's how he's seeing you right as far as righteousness goes. But he loved you before that ever happened. Are you listening to me? He valued you so much that he gave his life for you before you ever became the righteous of God in Christ. He doesn't just value you because he sees you through the lens of his son. Nuh-uh. Uh-uh. You get what I'm saying? So I'm not, I'm not dispelling that altogether. I'm saying you need to understand the difference between those two. There is none righteous. No, not one. No one is worthy. No one was found worthy except for Jesus. Okay, but that's not talking about the worth of blood. That's talking about our righteousness. I've lived such a righteous life that I'm worthy to take the title deed of the earth. No, I've lived a righteous life, so I'm the one uh, exception to the rule that there's none righteous, no, not one. No, okay. It's talking about our actions, our righteousness, our behaviors, the motivations of our heart. Okay, that's what that's talking about. But the love of God constrains us. And says that if one died for all, that's because all were dead. Okay? That is literally saying if you were the only one, he would have died for you. And he did. And I think that's how he sees it. Okay, so understand the difference. 
He shows he commendeth his love for us while we were yet in sin. Christ died for us. Okay? I had an experience once where I went with the Lord and saw myself when I was younger in a bedroom and I'm sitting on the bed and I'm a hippie because I used to be a hippie and I'm sitting there smoking a cigarette and I've got all my rock and roll albums out in front of me. I'm sitting cross-legged on the bed and I am in my, my worst state. I am a drug addict. I am, I am broken. I am not right with God. And I knew all that when I was in this experience where I am like looking down on myself in that bedroom, Jesus right next to me. And he speaks to me and he says, I wanted you so much. Five words. That's all he said. I wanted you so much. And you know why I did that? Because he wanted me to understand this is the lens that I look at you through. That little baby, okay, that you would take on the world to protect, that hasn't done any right or wrong. That is a God kind of love. And he, listen, God doesn't have that kind of love for you at that level. Oh, it's just like the way I love my child. Yes, times a million. Okay, you can't, you don't out love God. You can't out love him. You can't, you know, love your little baby more than he does. And you can't love your little baby more than he loves you. You can't do it. As a matter of fact, if Linda's love and my love for our kids were put together, and then we add a few other people, and we combined all of our love and said, there, now, we love that child more than God does. can't. You can't out-love him. You can't out-commit him. You can't out-faithful him. He's more faithful to you than you are to yourself. Did you realize that? He cares about more, your success more than you care about it. And see, these are the lies that the enemy tells us, the opposite of all those things I just said. So, okay, I know I'm kind of rambling here, but I need you to understand that God is not like you. You are not like him, okay? I don't mean in any way. That's, you know what I'm saying, okay? The, the, the minor examples that we have about unconditional love pale in comparison to the massive demonstrations and proof that God loves us, okay? We're down here. Jesus did that, right? What did Jesus say? He says, if you know how to give good gifts to your kids, come on, who am I, right? And he says, he says you, if your son asked you for a loaf of bread, would you give him a rock? I'm better than you. That's what he's saying, okay? You get it? He's saying, hey, you're, 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 you would do this, and I'm better than you. So why does that matter? Because when the enemy comes to you, and he points at your physique, or he points at your intelligence, or he points at your relationships, or he points at your failures, or he points at any reason why your worth should not be up here, but down here, you have to be strong enough to rebuke him. Okay, that's what I'm saying. You have to actually believe that your value is at a place where God says, I'll trade the whole world for you. It might be so, the scripture says, that a good man would give his life for another man. That's actually happened. Okay? But for God to, to trade the whole world, there's the old song we used to sing. He left the splendors of heaven, knowing his destiny was a lowly hill on Golgotha, there to give or shell, yeah, there to give his life for me. If that isn't love, if that isn't love, the oceans are dry. The sparrows can't fly. There's no stars in the sky. If that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this. If that isn't love, you must understand that your current circumstances are not worthy to be measured up against God's love. If he loved me, he would do this. If he loved me, he would do this. If he loved me, he'd heal. If he loved me, he'd give money. If whatever it is, that you cannot afford to measure your worth and value up against your current circumstances. If you do that, you will fail. And I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just saying it's true because that's the weapons of the enemy. Satan is always trying to use your circumstances to declare to you that what you have believed about the love and the goodness of God cannot possibly be true. You must not just with your mouth say you believe the opposite, you must in your heart believe the opposite. And with your mouth is good too. You need to open your mouth sometimes to say that. I refuse to believe that. 
I know when I stand in heaven, his, he will show me all things and I will say, you were good always, you were loving always, and so on and so on. You must measure your self-worth based on who he is, not on who you, who you are. Not on your conditions. Here's a saying I have all the time. This is one I think is worth, worth writing down, okay? I don't know who made it up. I might have. I can't say for sure. But hear this. Stop. And I mean it. Write it down and put it on your refrigerator to remind yourself. Or maybe at the end of your bed. So when you wake up in the morning. I don't know. Stop challenging His Word with your circumstances or by your circumstances and start challenging your circumstances by His Word. By His stripes I am healed. I am the Lord thy God that healeth thee. I will never leave you or forsake you. Over and over and over declare. Stop challenging God's Word with your circumstances. Well, God, what about this? I know you said this, but what about... Stop doing that. Flip it on its head and start challenging your circumstances by His Word. His Word has power. His Word is true. He is the Word of God. He is truth. He cannot lie. If He's a liar, then, then leave. I mean, don't... Sur uh, don't leave. You get what I'm saying. Let's read a couple scriptures. Can we do that? Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is a struggle I believe that every human being has. We do not understand how God sees us and the price he was willing to pay. And he who spared not, whoa, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. He who spared not his own son, will he not also through him freely give you the things that you have need of? If he didn't spare his son, if he didn't give the most valuable thing in the universe to you, personally to you, you know what the enemy's job is? Why? Why, 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 why this, why this? You know what? I don't know. I don't know. And you know what? You probably won't know either. You know, I, I know that we feel like if we had the answer to everything, it would make life easier. And maybe it would. I don't know. I don't know why. God waits sometimes to tell you why. I do know this. Hindsight, looking behind you, is better than foresight. Usually once I go through a trial and I come out the other end, even if it doesn't work out the way I want, I usually can look back and go, I, I get it. Now, that, that's not a promise. Okay, Are you listening to me? Sometimes you need to buck up like a man or a woman. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying. Sometimes you need to grab yourself by the shirt collar and say, stop doing that. Stop it. You know? Smack yourself in the face. It's not a promise that you're going to understand everything this side of heaven. It's just not. I believe you will a lot. I have uh, God has shown me so many things as I've spent time in His Word, spent time in prayer. I mean, I have anguished. I am still anguishing over some things that are happening in my environment. Okay, my my family, my life, blah 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 blah. What's going on in the world? There are questions I have that I just like Job. Not that I'm suffering like Job, but I'm just like God. I don't get it. My limited understanding thinks you're not doing the right thing. And I know, like Job, when he appears to me, I will go, I've heard about you with the hearing of my ears, now my eyes see you, and I'm going to shut my mouth and say nothing else because you're always right. And when you look in heaven and you see the multitudes of men and women stand in front of God and he is sending judgments on the earth, you know what they're saying? They're not going, wow, God, you know, hmm, ah, hmm. I'm not really sure, you know, uh, people are suffering. I don't know if you're doing the right thing, you know. Here's what I think, God. Nobody says nobody. Every person, you know what they say? You're right. Dang it, you've always, they don't say dang it. You've always been right. You were always right, and you're right now too. See, here's what you can do. You can believe that now and start acting like that now. Instead of letting Satan constantly cause you to question every single thing that's happening in your life. Now, it's different if you're being dumb and dumb things are happening to you. I mean, that's, that's on a different plane. All right, all right, all right. Is anybody getting anything out of this? I'm telling you, these are truths that we need to be reminded of. So I know all this stuff. Good. You need to get it in your heart. It needs to be hammered like a nail into your spirit so that you can keep going. I'm preaching to myself. 
Okay, I just because you know these things doesn't mean you're just going to automatically uh, again, Jim, you shouldn't be so transparent. I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to tell you the truth. When stuff happens to me that I don't like or that's bad or that hurts my body or my friends or my kids or whatever, I almost automatically, why God? Why? That's our human nature. But somewhere along the line, the goodness of God, the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of my shirt collar and says, hey, you, remember who I am. Remember what you preach to other people. It's the truth. You're not just preaching good ideas that, that you hope are the truth. This, I am the truth, Jim. And what I've said in my word is true. And I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. And maybe you go your whole life and don't understand why you didn't get that thing that you wanted so dearly. You know what? One day you'll understand. One day you'll stand before him and he'll say, here's why. And you will weep tears of joy and say, thank you for not listening to my complaints. <laughs> and I'm not judging. I'm really not. Because like I said, I'm preaching the choir here. All right. Let's read. Hang with me. Just a few more minutes. Hang with me. Let's read a couple of scriptures. Oh, there's something I wanted to say to you. So you might be saying to yourself right now, I know some of this stuff. I already know this stuff. Here's an example the Lord showed me years ago. He said, Jim, eating my word, the bread of life, okay, manna. You say, he's gave, he, man shall not live by alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you know where that verse came from? Jesus said it. He's quoting the Old Testament, okay. It happened in the context of manna coming down from heaven, the heavenly bread, supernatural bread. And he says, God fed you manna in the wilderness so that you might know that Man shall not live by bread alone. So he actually connected that verse that we apply to the scripture rightfully, okay? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We say that's the Bible and that's God talking to us and so on. But initially, he connected that, that, that reality to literal manna. Okay, so why is that important? Because you need to eat every day. Unless you're fasting, you eat every day. As a matter of fact, you eat multiple times a day. Some of you. You get what I'm saying? It's, it's literally the way he made your physique. That's why you get hungry. We call it a hunger pain. Okay, Pain means there's something wrong. Tum Tum is empty. I need to put something in it. Okay, He did that. God did that. And he said, I did that to show you a higher spiritual truth that you need to eat every day. So many Christians. Okay, I'm not criticizing, but so many Christians just do not do that. They cannot seem to make themselves do that. That's why I tell people over and over, get yourself a Bible app that's a read through the Bible in the year or some other program and stick with it. Even if you fail 50% of the time, 50% of a goal, of, of a, an aim or a goal is better than 100% of nothing. Okay? Yeah, okay, you get what I'm saying. So why do we say that? Because some meals that you make let's say if you're a mom out there and you make meals for your family some of those meals are really good i i preached you know i preach almost every day i preach for 40 years every sunday you know i'm preaching every friday night and preaching whatever do you know that most of those meals i am going somewhere with this most of those meals are the same thing you know does anybody get tired of eating the same meal every day i mean i do i i have the same thing for breakfast pretty much every day but it sustains me Oftentimes people go, Pastor, that is a great message. And I'll go, well, what, what was it about that that was so great? I don't know, but it was great. <laughs> what I'm saying is some revelations and some meals, food, quote unquote, that God gives you from his word are supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. I mean, they are over the top. It's like going out like I went yesterday's to, uh, yesterday me and Linda to a taco place. And I mean, it was over the top. I was like in food heaven. You know, but most of my meals are not that way. I, I'm trying to tell you, as you read the Word of God and as you hear messages from ministers who are literally called to do that, they're not always, sometimes it's just going to be bacon and eggs every day. Once in a while, they're going to make some big souffle or what. You get what I'm saying? Don't think it's always got to be some explosive over the top. There is a tremendous weight of value that comes with eating, even if you're eating the same stuff every day. Are you following what I'm saying? Okay, don't go, well, I already know that's so what I need to do. No, 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 no. It's good. One of the ways it gets in your spirit is repetition. Okay? You don't have to have a gourmet meal every time, but keep eating. All right, so I said that. 
Um, gosh, I need to get to the scripture, but I, I had these on the front end because I know God wants me to tell them. All right. Okay. I started a final quest and I got off track. I do this all the time. My apologies. All right. There's a story in the first book. Nancy, God bless you. There's a story. Listen close now. Hone in. The very last few pages in the very first book, The Final Quest, there is a story. It is a true story from a heavenly perspective. It is about a man named Angelo. Yeah, it's not, this is not some fake individual. There was a real person. I'm not going to tell you the whole thing. I'm just going to give you the cliff notes here. Angelo was deaf and dumb. Okay, and because he was deaf and dumb, of course, he, well, I don't think he was completely dumb, maybe a speech impediment. Anyway, you get the picture. Not the kind of person you would invite into the pulpit. Not the kind of person that most people would even look twice at. Because he had a bad experience in family life or whatever, he wound up being homeless. Okay. Don't think everybody on the street is the same because they're not. Okay. We have to see through God's eyes. Anyway, you know the whole treasure hunt thing? Some of you know what that is? Treasure hunting? We have to get past seeing people on the natural plane. And there's a way to do that. If you'll hang on, I'll tell you real quick. So in this experience, uh, this man, Angelo, is now in heaven. He, he died. Okay. And he was appreciated by almost no one. Lived on the streets in a cardboard box, but was fully committed, sold out lover of Jesus that actually they call died a martyr. And it, okay, so I'm not, I can't go into all that. But here's the point. Rick, in, the, in his experience, never paid attention to this man because of, are you listening now? His appearance. Matter of fact, and he wrote this down, so I'm just quoting what he wrote. He said, he said of this man, as he just casually passed him by in the street, well, we're, there's one of those crazy Elijah preachers that, that make people get turned off for the gospel. Mm, stab in the heart. Now he's standing in front of him. Are you listening to me? In heaven. Not just in heaven, but he is seated close to the throne of God. That's a whole other issue, but I won't go there. Seated close to the throne of God. And he is more regal looking than any human being on earth. That doesn't mean physically necessarily. I mean, I don't know. I think we all change physically, but that's not the point. The point is, here he is. Are you listening? A king sitting on a throne. A homeless guy. A hom you have to read this story. A homeless guy is now a king. Now listen to me. Listen, listen, listen. This is what I'm trying to say about human worth. God does not see you now. I mean, he does. He's not stupid. He knows what's going on. But he sees you in the future. <laughs> Isaiah, I hope you're listening. You know, that song I always like to sing, I think, came from King Clement. I saw you in the future. And you look much better than you do today. I saw you in the future. In the future. In the future. And you look much better than you do today. Can you see yourself in the future? I'm yelling because I want you to hear me. If you could see yourself or another person in the future, it would change everything. Remember when Jesus was on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Wait a minute. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were ripping out his beard. They were slicing gouges in his back. They were hammering nails in his feet. They were putting, a, they knew what they were doing. They were killing him. They knew exactly what there was Jesus deceived. No, you didn't. let me tell you what he was saying. He was saying, if they could see me an hour from now or whatever, seated, seating next to you in my glory, they would never do what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing because they can't see who I really am. How can you see others who they really are if you can't even see yourself who you are? I had the privilege of seeing someone in the future. Actually, I've had a couple experiences. It's, it's challenging because we gauge people's value by what we see right now. I understand what I'm saying? And let, let me say this. It starts with you. Paul said it this way. He says, we know no man after the flesh. 
I think what he was talking about is we have to see them. This is the whole treasure hunting thing. This, okay. So Angelo, a homeless, broken man, was a king, wound up being a king. And the point was, if Rick could have seen him on earth, how he now was seeing him in heaven, it would have changed entirely. And the Lord said that. He said, if my people would have saw in him what I see, they would have taken him into some of the biggest pulpits in the world and he would have been a tremendous encouragement. All right. I'm not talking about giving excuse for bad behavior or anything like that. I'm talking about who is that person? What did God mean for them to be compared to what they are today? Okay. They are not the sum total. And you, are you listening? I'm talking to you now. You are not the sum total of all of your actions and all of your experiences. You are, in reality, what God said you are. When he thought you up, and trust me, he did. Before I was knit in my mother's womb, you saw all my days. David said, all of my days were written down in your book before even one of them came to pass. Now that's forethought. You think God's plan was for you to be altogether who you are today? Absolutely not. I saw you in the future and you look much better than you do today. Here's the deal. If you see that and you believe it, you will begin to, it's like a gravitational pull. Any Star Trek fans out there? There's a one Star Trek program, I remember, where the USS Enterprise, and there was this big cone, and it was caught in the tractor beam, and it was drawn, that's the way the love of God is. That's the way the truth of who you are is. Not what you see yourself as right now. I'm not saying you're not, okay? You got, you got health issues. You got m mental issues. You got blah, 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 blah issues. Okay, I'm not saying it's not true. I'm saying I saw you in the future. God wrote that future. If you can grasp this, he wrote what you are in the future before you were ever born. You're on a journey. And if you don't believe you're going to get there, you likely will not. You must believe the truth about who you are. All right? Anybody out there besides James? James has given some good comments, amen, but nobody else. All right. I got to bounce through these scriptures real quick. I'm almost done. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, you can go back and read all these. I think I'll probably just get to this first one. But I've kind of highlighted all of these in one way or the other. So 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. Let Listen close to what it's saying. This is the Apostle Paul talking. Actually, it's not. It's Holy Spirit talking through the Apostle Paul. Or Paul the Apostle, whichever you like best. All right. For you see your calling. See. Okay. See is, is not naturalized. It's how, what you perceive. Don't let your natural eyes see in you what your spiritual eyes refuse to see. Okay. You're not just what you see. With your natural eyes. All right. I don't know if I said that right. You see your calling, brothers and sisters, that not many wise, huh, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, nobility. Do you realize your nobility? Okay. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called by God. Okay. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And he has chosen the weak things. You know, you can literally, I think, take the word things out and put people because he's not talking about stop. He is talking about people. When he says, when he starts out saying not many wise, he's talking about people. Not many mighty, he's talking about people. And not many noble, he's talking about people. So then he goes on. God hasn't chosen those. He's chosen the foolish. He's talking about you and me, okay? No offense, okay? He's, he's talking about those who aren't mighty, those who aren't wise. Why does he do that? That he could put to shame, okay, the wise. And God has chosen the weak in the world to put to shame those who are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised by most people are chosen by God and things which are not to bring to nothing those things that are. So here's why he does that. So that no flesh will glory in his presence. I'm closing my, <clears throat> my laptop. 
this is not hyperbole. Okay, I start out this program, and if you did come in late, I, I adjure you to go back and listen to the beginning of it, because it's important. I'm not criticizing people, but I'm saying that sometimes we just get together and we rub each other's shoulders and we just give all these prophetic words about how great you are and how awesome you are. I get that, because probably it's all true. But this is not just somebody trying to make you feel better. Ryan, I love you. And I'm asking Ryan, I'm asking James, I'm asking anyone who's coming on at the end of this, I beg you to go back and listen to the beginning of this. Okay, this is not just to make you feel good about yourself. Okay, there's Daniel. It says, I don't know, Daniel. Okay, but again, even if you've listened to this, and I'm not trying to boast my own program. I don't believe this is about me. This is about what the Lord is trying to say. I would, if this were me and I, somebody else was preaching, I would get this ground into my soul. I'd listen to it four or five times, and I do that. I listen to messages sometimes four or five times. Why do I do that? Because I don't get it all the first time. So I get it, it's like chewing. I get it again and again and again to where it becomes a part of who I am. It's not about just all, you know, scrolling. Okay. You must see who you are, and you are not qualified to see who you are. Are you listening to me? I know I'm being strong. It's Papa Jim talking to you now. I'm preaching like a dying man to dying men. Okay. You must see, you are not qualified to see yourself rightly. You must see yourself through his eyes. I mean, you are because you're in Christ. You get what I'm saying. But you're not outside of God. You're not qualified. You must go to the Lord and say, please help me see myself rightly. And the guy I was talking about, Angelo, classic example of misinterpreting someone by outward appearance. Okay, you can't afford to do it to you. Actually, you can't afford to do it to God, measuring him according to your circumstances. You can't afford to do it to the other people in your life. You know, let's say, let me get, I'm going to end with this story. Let's say your mom or your dad. My dad was not saved. There were times he was wicked and then times he was a pretty good man. But all through his life, as far as I know, he was never saved. Okay. We got saved, okay, I was talking to a young person about this. So we got saved and we got a lot of flack from my dad, bless his soul. And uh, <clears throat> his name is Ed Moore, he's in heaven. We got a lot of flack from him. He had some experiences growing up in a religious home. He had some bad things, blah, 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 whatever, lots of bad things. Hey, can you, can you hear this right now? Everybody has bad stuff happening to them. Quit thinking you're some special case. You're special, but you're not a special case. People say this. Oh, I got hurt in church. Honey, listen to me. Everybody gets hurt in church. You know why? Because there are broken people just like you in church. Okay? We cannot use that as an excuse. People get hurt in their family. People get hurt in their, on the job. People get hurt all the time. You cannot run away. All right, anyway, so my dad hurt us. He did. Okay? Maybe even borderline abusive at times. It doesn't matter. Listen. Okay, I want everyone to just stop writing for a minute and listen to what I'm saying. So my dad was borderline abusive. I didn't like my dad very much. I had a hard time getting along with him. There were seasons in my life I had to pull away from him because he was just so toxic to us. He didn't know. He didn't know if my dad could see me today, way back then, he would have never done that. If my dad could go to heaven and see me in heaven, he'd have never done that. If I, listen to me now, if I li were able to see my, I've seen my dad in heaven. I have. Literally, I've seen my dad standing next to Jesus in heaven. If, while my dad was alive on the earth, I was able to see him in heaven after he passed, it would have changed everything. Now, again, the question is, people say, well, why, why doesn't God let you do that? I don't know. I'm not God. That's not my business. Okay? It's just, I, all I know is it's true. And I'm latching hold of that. I don't have to know why for it to be true. Okay? Sometimes we feel that. I have to know why or it's not true. No, it's true whether you know why or not. Okay? So I just, I grab a hold of that. If you saw you in the future, you'd think of yourself differently. If you saw 
your husband, your wife, your best friend, your parent, your dog, your... Well, I shouldn't go there. You see what I'm saying? Things are going to change. And they're going to change dramatically. I saw you in the future. I saw me in the future. And I look much better than I do today. I saw me. Well, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. Are you getting this? Remember, I started out saying, you really need to get this. Okay? I don't always go this hard on this, but you this is one of those things that really can change your life. You hear people say, that, this bar of soap will change your life. <laughs> Why do they say that? Because I guess they know everybody wants their life changed. Well, this is something, hey, George, that actually will change your life. No, I'm, I guarantee it. I'll 100% money back guarantee if you truly have a revelation of who you are and get this in your heart and, and to where it is driven like a stake into your heart, it will absolutely unequivocally change your life. Maybe not overnight. You get what I'm saying? I want you to say with me, I saw me in the future and I look much better than I do today. I saw me, me. Can you see that? Okay. All right. I've delivered my soul. I pray this is helpful for you. And I pray that you'll um, give it to somebody else. People need to hear this so badly. People need to hear this so badly. I beg you to go back and listen to it again. Forget the comments. I'm, thank you, all of you. Great comments. I love it when you comment. But more than anything, I want your spirit to listen closely and say, God, give me... Because, see, I know we know this theologically. I know you already know this theologically because we've heard it, right? We know it. But is it a living, daily reality in your soul? That comes only by revelation. That doesn't come by reading words on a page and going, yep, got it. <laughs> All right. Papa, thank you for your words. God, I pray that you will expressly, for the ones that are hungry enough to ask you for it, that you will give the revelation of identity and worth from your perspective into their hearts today. In Jesus' name. I believe you to do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, we're in the process of moving. I've got some work to do. I'm not going to be on the next couple days. Uh, perhaps this will be a good opportunity for you to go back tomorrow and listen to this again. So uh, today's Wednesday, so Thursday and Friday I won't be on. I won't be on again until Monday. My apologies for that. I just, yeah, Christ Ambassadors and Heather, I love you guys so much. Thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, share this with somebody. Amen. God bless you. Love you. See you next Monday. Give yourself.